Welcome to another episode of Destination Durham. First, I would like you to join me in welcoming Alicia fonash Willette for being our host for tonight's episode. We are going to hear from Durham Economic Development Commission and about some of the seminars that they have been hosting to help our local businesses thrive. You're also going to learn about the Coggenshaw Area Transition Team. They are a group of concerned citizens that are looking to create a better sustainable community for us all to live in. And finally, you are going to listen from Betsy Dean and Durham Middlefield Youth and Family Services with an update on some of their wonderful programs that they have for our youth and for our families. Lastly, I'd like to say congratulations to the class of 2014. I attended the a graduation ceremony at Coggenshaw and it was absolutely beautiful. I know you also wish our students the best in everything that they plan to do. Enjoy tonight's segment. Thank you, Laura. We are here at the Valley Shore Community TV Studio in Westbrook, and we are meeting with Sue Vanderzee of the Coggachog Area Transition Group, as well as Ralph Chase, who was a panelist in one of their most recent discussions. We'll also be talking with Betsy Dean, who is the Director of Durham Middlefield Youth and Family Services. Coggenshaw Area Transition is a local group dedicated to promoting a more thoughtful and sustainable give-and-take approach to living on this planet now and in the future. They are inspired to tap into all the good efforts already afoot in our community, from farmers markets, local CSAs, clean energy initiatives, solar arrays on school buildings, and recycling and composting. They recently sponsored a special program at the Durham Activity Center called Living Through Hard Times, a panel discussion with residents of Durham and Middlefield who recounted their experiences of living through the rationing, victory gardens, and tough times of the Depression and World War II on the home front. Discussion centered on their lives as children and young adults during the tough times of the 1930s and 40s. Um, what they remember from growing up during hard times. Yes. The focus of the discussion was sustainability in the past and how it fits in with our future. There was laughter and a few tears as they shared memories and insights. Their stories were poignant and thoughtful lessons learned, hope for the future. So we're here with Sue Vanderzee of the Coggenshaw Area Transition Group and Ralph Chase, who was recently a panelist during their discussion about sustainability and World War II. And Sue, what can you tell us about the Coggenshaw Area Transition Group? What's it all about? The Coggenshaw Area Transition Group was founded about two years ago when a group of people, um, including myself, got together and started to talk about some of the issues that we feel will come up in the future with regard to energy and the economy and sustainability. And we found that we were very much on the same page and that the transition model, which is actually uh, actually comes from Great Britain, it was founded by a man named Rob Hopkins in 2006, that the transition model emphasizes community values and, and building community and people looking to the future as a community in a more positive way. Sometimes some of the statistics are very scary and people get paralyzed or think, well, I can't do anything, so I won't do anything. And transition is a way to overcome some of that. Now, why should this sustainability, why is this important to our community? Well, I think it's important to our community on a couple of levels. On a, on a very basic and practical level, it's important to us because 
if as a society we have to begin to use less energy or find different ways to produce it. Um, that's important. Um, the fact that we can produce energy in different ways is, and in Durham, we have so many people who installed solar. Mm -hmm. So the idea that we can get our energy in different ways is, um, should be an affirming kind of a thing. People should feel good about that fact. And also the issue of, you know, we've been through a big economic upheaval. And one of the things the transition believes is that, um, that we can't continue to use the resources of the earth and in the way that we have in the past, okay. as if they're limitless. Mm -hmm. And so if things like that are gonna change, then um, the response to it is a more positive, more impactful response if it's done at a community level rather than you or I going and changing our light bulbs and mm -hmm. being very um, religious about our recycling. Um, if we do those things, that's wonderful. But if a community can do it, it has more impact and it makes people feel like they're doing more and can have can have an impact on the future that's measurable. Right, well that was a great segue into my next question, because my question to you is, how can we take these I global ideas of sustainability and apply them to our everyday lives as a community to make it better? Um, one of the ways is by, actually Durham, uh, and Middlefield too, but Durham particularly, is um, ahead of the game in several ways. The whole Solarize Solarized program, Durham, yep. uh, the fact that we have a farmer's market, um, shopping locally, the idea that as much stuff as we can buy that's produced, grown locally, um, that that helps build a local, uh, healthy local economy for the people that live with us. Mm -hmm. And so all of those things are things that have local import. Um, some people are interested in, you know, making sure that there are more bike trails or hiking trails. Um, there are all kinds of things to educate ourselves about as, and Kat's done that, tried to do that through a movie series and through other dis panel discussions right. and other discussions about um, organic lawn care, for right. instance. And, uh, how to use the internet to recycle your stuff um, in terms of free cycle and some of the some of the options that are available for people who have excess stuff. Uh, the whole idea of sharing with neighbors. Uh, does right. everybody really need a leaf blower? Right. Or, you know, can you share? Right. And what are you willing to share? Right. Um, right. So there are all kinds of ways in which we can make ourselves a community that's bound tighter together mm -hmm. by the interactions and also uses less energy and supports a thriving local economy. Right, so um, you were talking about interaction. So you hosted or sponsored a panel discussion, discussion about living through hard times, which you asked Ralph to be a part of, I'm assuming. <laughs> yes, that's true. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so Ralph, how did you get involved in becoming a panelist for the organization for that event? I'm not really sure. I was, <laughs> I was, uh, I was asked if I would participate, I think probably because uh, I'm old and I lived through that period and uh, might have a few memories of about what went on. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And what did your panel discussion specifically focus upon? Well, we we told a lot of different stories about our, our personal experiences in the 30s and 40s uh, as a result of uh, what each one of us was involved in. Um, I can obviously talk better about what I was involved in. And I'm, I remember saying something to the effect that I grew up on a farm and so consequently didn't feel the uh, stress of bread lines and all the of that. Rationing I, I, and I, I the... never, we had rationing of course mm -hmm. during the World War II, but uh, on the farm we had plenty of food and, and uh, we raised crops and sold them and uh, it really was not very difficult. Um, to me, what I saw and what I experienced was more 
in, in traveling to South Carolina when my family had another home and seeing things like chain gangs building highways, mm -hmm. which I never saw up here. And uh, that made such an impression on me as a, as a youngster, seeing uh, people working hard in the hot sun in striped uniforms and fellows standing up there with a shotgun. Wow. And uh, yeah, that was my reaction. Wow. <laughs> exactly. And and uh, and that really happened. And and so you you, uh, you, I have very very strong feelings about what went on in that that period, in, as far as my own personal experience was concerned. Not from uh, lack of anything that I had. It was just what I saw around me. Right. So those ideals that you learned on the farm and growing your own food yeah. and. Um, the ideals and the practices of that World War II era, how can we put them to use now in the 21st century? Well, uh, I, that's a good question uh, because having grown up on a farm and marrying a farm girl, we love to grow our own vegetables and things of this nature and we supply my three daughters and eight grandchildren with all of their vegetables and so forth. And, and to us, it's a labor of love. Mm -hmm. We grew up doing that, and, and we learned from our parents how to do it and uh, so forth. So it's, it's, it's fairly easy for us to do that. I think it's important that more people get involved in doing that. And I'm delighted to, when I hear of um, people in town having their own gardens, um, people like uh, uh, Melinda Naples, With the uh, farmers market, uh, farmers farm. market, and also her uh, using some land for people to have their own gardens, a community garden. Commu yeah, you know, uh, I think that's what has to happen. People have to learn how to take care of themselves, right? Without the stop and shop and then so forth around exactly. the corner. And exactly. I think uh, uh, to to uh, uh, Sue's point about. The, the neighbors that, uh, working together. This is a uh, this is one way it can happen. And, right. And uh, so I think uh, um, what goes on is is quite important. People learning how to take care of themselves. And I, we've had such good times for so long that that I don't think the present generation and maybe even before that uh, really know what to do when the lights go out. Right. They pick up the phone and start screaming at somebody. And um, in, in our day, when the lights went out, you said, okay, get out the candles. Right, and a board game, yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. and uh, stay away from your father. <laughs> so, Sue, what can we look forward to from CAT in the future? Do you have any other upcoming programs or events happening? Well, one of the things that we would like to do, uh, we will continue to do educational programs. What exactly that will be, we ha actually have a meeting next week of this core group of about 12 or 13 people at this point in time that's mm -hmm. sort of been the steering committee. Uh, what we would like to do this year, however, is hold what the transition movement calls an unleashing, which means uh, an event that w would try to involve as many people in the town as possible by either having entertainment, uh, by hooking it into the schools, by having a series of workshops over the course of a day. Uh, we would like to do that this upcoming year. And the idea of an unleashing is that it broadens your core group, as well as the people who have come to other things. There were probably 40 people at the panel discussion. Right. And um, we did a chicken tour early on that 90 people came to that was hysterical. I can't imagine 90 <laughs> people going to visit chickens, but they did. Chickens couldn't either. Um, so the, this event will be a day-long event, and it will be called an unleashing, and people should look for both our educational programs, which will be ongoing, as well as this unleashing. The idea of the unleashing is that people will come and they will say, I'm really interested in expanding a community garden concept. And then they will, there will be a list of people who would like to do that. So they can or kind of I'm, meet together. Right, there and can be affinity groups because one right. of the things that the transition movement says is that we're all meeting to death. Right. And we, there are too many committees and, and a lot of times we're not really interested in the whole thing but we're really interested in taking care of the older people in our midst or we're really interested in organic gardening or right. we're really interested in good nutritious food in the schools. Right. And so if people can come together 
and say, I'm really interested in doing a bike trail from Durham to Middlefield. Then you can connect then them with the Then it can begin people. to happen. And right. so then the cat group, the core group that we are now, becomes just sort of like a connect the dots group. Right. It doesn't right. have to necessarily do anything. It just has to encourage people mm -hmm. and give them the tools. And right. we have so many groups, like the Exchange Club, of which Ralph is a member, yeah in town that already do wonderful things. Right. Exchange Club does scholarships and they do a road race and they right. do clean road cleanups and French so fries. Yeah. French, <laughs> French fries, fries at the yes. Durham Fair. <laughs> so they do wonderful things and they the garden clubs are so active right. and so good. And so we see us as not doing anything that they're doing right. but sort of connecting the dots, telling people hey, you know, if you'd like to clean up the road, you should really call Ralph Chase right. and sign up with the Exchange Club. So or, how can a member of the community get a hold of you to get to these resources? Uh, to come to, well, hopefully in the newspaper they will, and on the town website, they will see announcements of upcoming programs, mm -hmm. or they can get in touch with either myself, uh, Sue Vanderzee, I'm in the telephone book, um, or uh, Lori Martin, Okay. Also in the telephone book, <laughs> or Deb Norco Brown, or Jen Huddleston, or Kathy Weber, all of whom Joanne Nitch, all of whom would be able to steer a person in the right direction. In the right direction. Thank you. Um, but hopefully, you know, as programs occur, there will be notices, and so people will be able to come and then sign up if they want to be part of the core group. Right. Right. Well, Sue and Ralph, I want to thank you so much for joining us on this episode of Destination Durham and enlightening us about your group and uh, sustainability through World War II and even through today. Mm, our pleasure. Don't look at me. Your hair's a bit frizzy today. Oh, you should pick that up. <laughs> oh, you're such a dork. Loser. Here, let me help you with that. Oops. <laughs> Every day, kids witness bullying. Oh, look! Your crush is looking at you. <laughs> Poor you. They want to help, but don't know how. See, no one here is going to help you. because no one Teach your you. kids how to be more than a bystander. Visit StopBullying.gov. Destination Durham was at this year's Memorial Day Parade. Here are some highlights. The Memorial Day tradition continues this year, Durham residents of all ages coming together to honor our veterans. I love the fact that we honor, honor our patriots. Uh, this is Memorial Day, it's not about barbecues, it's about honoring those who served our nation, lost their lives, and those who are still serving. From the town's volunteer fire department to the middle school marching band, everyone had a role to play in this year's parade. For 12 years or so, walked with the uh, Cub Scouts and the Boy Scouts and uh, now the soccer club and just really enjoy the community that we have here. And what would a Durham parade be without the cannon? This is actually our um, cannon that we use for ceremonies because it's ornateness about it. It's like a replica of a Civil War, Revolutionary War cannon. We enjoy it. We start the road race and a uh, great feel for the town. And even with all of the activity in the parade, no one forgets the true meaning of the holiday. Always, re always remember, freedom isn't free. Many hundreds of thousands of men and women have served to protect the freedom of each of us. My whole family was in the military, so I, I want to honor all of the people of Durham. The Durham Economic Development Commission recently held a seminar on social media marketing, which was sponsored by SCORE. SCORE is a mentoring program that is offered to small and new businesses. Destination Durham was on scene, so let's take a look. The Durham Economic Development Commission has been sponsoring a series of seminars to help small businesses grow. The first in that series focused on social media marketing techniques. Uh, Constant Contact has regional development directors that work directly for Constant Contact, and then um, I'm part of the New York team, you know, I used to be playing with, and myself and uh, 12 other team members that are small business owners like myself um, come out and talk with small business owners and organizations of a smaller scale, um, where they kind of stay in the bigger cities and usually their audiences are 150 or more. 
this gives an opportunity to talk about email, social media, marketing stuff, uh, with businesses and organizations too. Because that is currently what everybody is doing. Everybody's attached to their phones, their iPads, and we want to learn how to reach out to them. Actually, Bill Ward came to an Economic Development Commission meeting. Um, I took his card, and I am now part of. I go to score to be mentored, and I brought it up to Bill and our other mentor John that we wanted to have a social media and email marketing workshop, which will be leading to other workshops that we can take advantage of. That's fine. SCORE supports local businesses through mentoring programs. SCORE is a nonprofit organization dedicated to serving small business and small business communities, both existing and startups. And SCORE has been around for 50 years nationally. It started back in 1964. We're basically a resource to the Small Business Administration uh, out of, uh, this seminar focused on social media marketing tools and was very well attended. Facebook, LinkedIn, Pinterest, and many other social media platforms are important, and choosing the best type for your business is challenging. Hopefully everyone got as much out of the seminar as was hoped for. Everybody has a dream. Mine was to see the ocean. We're back now with Betsy Dean, who is the director of Durham Middlefield Youth and Family Services. Betsy's here to tell us about all the services that, and programs that are provided to our community. Hi, Betsy. Thanks for joining us today. Thanks for having me. So tell us, what is Durham Middlefield Youth and Family Services? Um, we have um, a brand new mission statement that our board put together, so I'm going to read it to you. The mission of the Durham Middlefield Youth and Family Services is to provide programs and resources to empower children and families to make positive choices for a healthy community. And basically what, what we're saying is that um, we do programs in the community, but we're also um, a referral spot. Um, if um, families are looking for um, counseling, uh, either for uh, marriage type of counseling or mental health counseling, um, we can um, give referrals uh, for that. If they are in need of um, food, we can connect them to the food pantries mm -hmm. um, and um, fuel assistance, that kind of thing. Right. If we have, if there is a resident that is in need of these services, how do they get in contact with you? Well, they can go to our website, which is dmyfs. Dot org. Yes. <laughs> um, we are on both the Durham Town website and the Middlefield um, website, and our f uh, phone number is there as well. So they can just call and inquire Absolutely. about the types of services mm -hmm. that, that you do offer. Um, and how is Durham Middlefield Youth and Family Service? Such a mouthful. It is. <laughs> how, um, how is it integrated into the community? Um, well, we do a lot of work with the um, students at Strong uh, Middle School and Kongchog High School. Um, we have a very strong presence in their EDGE program, um, which we provide um, staff and resources for all of the activities that are um, drug and alcohol free. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that we just did at the end of the school year was we did a sticker attack where the kids put on um, six uh, packs or 12 packs of beer, big stickers that say, hey you, it's illegal to buy for anyone under 21. Right, right. Um, and uh, so that's one of the things that we do. We try to provide activities that are um, you know, drug and substance free. Now, um, you also partner with the Durham Middlefield Wellness 
coalition. Um, yep. How did that partnership develop? What kind of uh, well, services do you do together? Um, that um, group has been together for probably 16, 15 or 16 years. Um, and over the last couple of years, um, we've come together um, as a coalition, meaning that we bring more uh, community members, business members um, to the table, parents. Um, and Durham Middlefield Youth and Family Services is, you know, uh, one cog, I guess, in the wheel. Mm -hmm. We have a lot of um, school uh, personnel there, business personnel, the police are there, um, social services, and um, we just work together as a group um, to provide uh, programs, education around um, substance-free community. To help these children in our community make these healthy choices. Absolutely, and also support the uh, families. Mm -hmm. um, so they're, you know, not, they're not the only ones saying that, you know, I don't want you out right. you know, drinking. Right, um, right, exactly. And what would you say is your most successful program? Oh, wow. Um, I don't know what is our most successful, but right now we're doing um, uh, the Summer Stock Theater. We're mm -hmm. doing Charlie Brown um, right now. But the other program um, that is very successful but nobody knows about is our Juvenile Review Board. Um, oh, well, tell us about that. Yeah, and what that is is we have um, a panel or committee of about um, 10 um, people um, from the clergy to um, counselors to um, DCF, uh, probate court. Um, and when we have a juvenile that gets in trouble, mm -hmm. um, the police write a, a ticket that says they can either go to court or they can come to the juvenile review board. Um, and if they choose to come to the juvenile review board, uh, they come before us, they explain what happened, they have to take responsibility. Um, for their actions. Yep, for their yes. actions. Um, and then they have to explain what happened to the committee. Um, and then they step out and the committee decides whether they're gonna you know, take the case or not. And if most of the time we do, they come in and we give the, um, uh, the teen diversions to do. Right, right. Um, And then they come back usually 30 days later um, and tell us how they did. Um, kind of a progress report. And the progress, almost. right. Yes, yes. And um, they're very happy that they didn't have to go to court. Um, right. And uh, it's been positive for everyone that we've done, so. That's terrific. And I, um, we also noticed you have a new logo in addition to your new mission statements. Why don't you how tell us we, how the new logo came about? We do have a new logo. Um, we, um, we do a search survey um, every two years, and one of the categories was um, the community values youth. Or, um, so what we decided that we would do is we would go out to the art students at Cognitog High School, um, and I went up and talked to them about you know, what youth and family was. Um, and we said, anybody that wants to put a design out there for a new logo, um, please do. Um, and we got many of them um, back, and we chose four to bring back to the board. And um, I don't know if you guys can see this or not. I wish I had a bigger one. Um, but this is our new logo. And um, Corey Hessman, who is a junior at Cog and Jog, designed this for us. Um, and we think it's great, and um, we can't wait to use it on our letterhead and at the fair and That's everywhere terrific. else. terrific. Well, we thank Corey for his wonderful design, and we thank you, Betsy, for joining us here at Destination Durham and telling us about your organization and all the great programs you offer. Thanks for having me. Thank you. And that's it for us at Destination Durham, linking our past and exploring our future. Thank you for joining us.